So the, I mentioned UMLS, and um, I mentioned that there is a problem with UMLS in that because you have within the UMLS independently developed rather heterogeneous subterminologies, um, you, you in effect create, in, in create the inevitability of forking because some people will choose some terminologies, some people will choose other terminologies. Now there is a reason uh, why the UMLS style approach has been so dominant, and it's becoming ever more dominant. So I mentioned already one aspect of this reason. Ontology is indeed useful. And so people think, well, let's build our own ontology. And so we get a million ontologies, and each one, because it was home-built, is somehow known and understood by the people who built it. Uh, and they also get paid for building it, where if they just use one that's already existing, then they won't get paid. Um, then the idea is that you can build several ontologies and then you map them so that you can put them together through mappings now there are no good mappings even after all these years that people have tried to map uh, different UMLS terminologies some people have devoted a lot of effort Olivier Bordenrider who we mentioned earlier has devoted a lot of effort to creating these mappings and his mappings are the best you get but they're out of date almost immediately because both of the things which are mapped get changed. And um, if you're going to rely on mappings and you have 100 terminologies, then you're going to need 100 times 99 mappings. You're going to need a lot of mappings. Um, and each of those mappings is going to be hard to maintain because the, the terminologies which are being mapped, if they're any good, are going to be changing through time. So the maps have to be, um, have to be uh, maintained by some kind of governance structure. Um, and th 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 they are going to yield a new risk of forking because people will use old mapping. And people are lazy. And computers are stupid. So the idea is that we get rid of mapping. No mapping should be allowed. And the, the way of doing that is to insist that there should be one ontology for each domain. So you slim down the UMLS to get rid of all redundancy. You slim down SNOMED to get rid of all redundancy. And um, in this way, you don't need to map, you just add. Now, again, there is the issue of application ontologies that I mentioned earlier. Sometimes you will need to take resources from existing reference ontologies, but you do that in such a way that you do not create redundancy. Uh, so, that's the goal. We invest resources in disjoint ontology modules which work well together in order to reduce the need for mappings to the very minimum. Now, why do we want to do this? Well. We want to create systems which will enable us to mine data, which will yield useful output. And if, if our codes are constantly in need of ad hoc repair, <coughs> then we'll be wasting resources. And every new terminology creates the possibility of a need for ad hoc repair. Every time you import a new terminology component into SNOMED, you have to examine how the corresponding phenomena were coded in earlier versions of SNOMED. And you have all of these people all over the world in big institutions using SNOMED to code their data. And that data can be out of date without them being aware of it because SNOMED itself has changed. And I know this because we have in Buffalo examples of SNOMED-based longitudinal studies where no one realized the urgency of keeping track of changes in SNOMED as the data was collected. So, unless you, make, unless you pay attention to the need to maximizing the degree of stability of the resources you're using for annotation of data, then you will be creating pitfalls for yourself which explode uh, or which snowball in, into the future. So how to do it right? How do we create an incremental process where what is good will survive, what is bad will fail, and we will have thereby a gradual convergence on the goal of one controlled category for each domain, which will have the features of maximal stability and also the feature that they will keep 
uh, in tandem with the advance of science. Now, it, this is a, this is a multi-headed goal. Um, it involves computational aspects. It involves aspects having to do with human egos. It involves economic aspects. In the case of SNOMED, it involves political aspects involving Denmark and other countries. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily about the human aspects for a minute. So the goal is this. People want to own their terminological resources because they want the terminological resources to address their needs. They want the terminological resources to evolve as their understanding of the science evolves. And if the resources are managed in Copenhagen, they're not going to trust those resources, so they'll use something and build themselves in that land. How do we change this situation? We have, to, we have to create a situation in which people feel correctly that they have control over the resources, that they get credit for investing time in those resources, and yet this is a collaborative venture which involves people in Copenhagen too. Um, now, this is where prospective standardization comes into play. Um, the, 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 think of, uh, for a minute about the gene ontology. The gene ontology started with a small group of individuals who worked in model organism research. And they had recognized that the mouse people were using their own terms for describing cell components or biological processes. And the fly people were using other terms, and the human people were using other terms, and the yeast people were using yet other terms. And so they sat down together, and they created the controlled vocabulary, so that they would all be using the same terms. They owned that vocabulary, in the sense that they were determining what it should contain. Gradually, it got bigger, and they divided it semi-officially, into different provinces. So now there is a province of uh, the gene ontology which deals with immunology terms. Because immunology is, a, is a, a, a system of biological processes. And the immunology part of the gene ontology has papers written about it which have authors which are not the authors of the original Go papers. And those terms within the immunology portion of the gene ontology are owned by the immunology experts who built that quite large fragments of the gene ontology. Now, in this way, because the immunology terms have been added to the gene ontology in a way which makes them consistent with the rest of the gene ontology, you have a situation where the ontology as a whole is growing in a way it should grow, but credit for the investment in the specific subdomain is still being uh, received by the experts who uh, are concerned about it because it contains the terms they need for their work. So this is the model that we should be trying to emulate. We maximize credit, we maximize influence by experts, we keep the door open to new experts constantly, so anybody can join this by demonstrating their expertise. And the, we, we get the architecture right. Now the gene ontology architecture is built to cope with a rapidly changing scientific field. So the gene ontology is updated every night. You, 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 on the outside, won't see all of those updates, but the people who are working on it are always working with the most up-to-date version. And the principles for versioning are very, very carefully articulated. Because this really is the key to making people have an incentive to invest in an existing resource. If you know that the resource that you're going to use will be updated only once a year. You might have terms every three months which you need to be using. And if you know that it's going to be an updated by some dark spirits in Copenhagen, <laughs> then you will... Um, if you, you, I, you should all think about what SNOMED spells if you read it backwards. Um, then you are not going to trust that resource. You're going to want a resource of your own in Atlanta with a nice name. Um, so the, the, the gene ontology really has paid attention to these incentivization factors very, very carefully. And if, if OnStar is to be a success, 
You need to make sure that OnStar can be owned by people who are experts in the field, even if they're outside your specific domain. For two reasons. One, criticism from the outside will improve it. Two, the more other people use it to annotate their data, the more valuable your data will be. And really, that, that is the, the great key to the Go success. The Go became successful only when other people started to use it for annotations. And now it's used for millions of annotations. So, now, and other uh, features which go hand in hand with this, clear documentation, published papers describing the ontology bring multiple benefits. You get credit, you, get, you help people on the outside, you force yourself to think carefully about what you're doing. Um, so the, the other things, I guess, are pretty obvious. Um, so you need a tracker, term tracker. Again, this is quite standard technology for doing this. So that people can request terms, request corrections to terms. And you need a help desk so that people who don't understand what you've done can immediately get some kind of response. People are only going to use your ontology if they have a feeling that there is a live human being at the other side who is willing and able to address their concern. So, the go. Amazingly successful. It solved the problem of data balkanization, but it covers only three kinds of biological entities. And even the biological process ontology is, is still relatively small in the sense that it deals only with what we can think of as natural or canonical biological processes. So it doesn't deal with biological processes inside a test tube, for instance. It doesn't deal with disease. Um, so there are no symptoms, no biomarkers, no protein interactions, no experimental process. There are big gaps here. And so this the OVO foundry was devised as a, a, a strategy of prospective standardization to fill these gaps. The, the yellow parts are the gene ontology. The organization here will return to, but this, these are the 13 original steps in the home study of the ontology world. The home study of the entirety of, the, of life and death. Um, so we have molecule ontologies, we have cell ontologies, we have organism and organ ontologies. Uh, we have an environment ontology. Um, and the, 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 we have population ontologies, although they are still very much in, uh, in under development. Um, most of the things down are going very well. Um, we still have some lingering... Uh, border dispute problem. So FMA and the GO both have a cellular component ontology, but the FMA has yielded, and, and the principles are being worked out, how the GO can take over the FMA cellular content. And that, that is the strategy that the other founder is committed to. You shouldn't have two people inventing the same wheel. Um, so this is a step-by-step -step evidence based approach to expanding the GO. We take the go and we push outwards towards disease and so forth. And the, this is a bit like science, uh, in the sense that collaboration is, is the crucial factor at every stage. So if I want to build a protein ontology for my purpose, then I need to work with the existing developers of the protein ontology. In just the same way that I would work with people developing electromagnetic theories in physics if I wanted to work in that field. It's just science. But we need a certain element of governance. So there is a, a standardization dimension to this, which you don't necessarily need in physics. You need it in astronomy and cosmology, because you need to standardize on the ways you describe planets, for instance. And that's the kind of dimension that we need in ontology, because we are focusing on creating a stable, useful resource for describing data. Um, for describing data in non-redundant ways, and the, the, the key is, and maybe I didn't emphasize this sufficiently, the key to the OVO family is that when we're describing the data, we do this by describing the reality that the data describes. So 
So it's easy to describe data. It's much more difficult to describe the reality. Sometimes the data is the reality. So sometimes we need an ontology for information. But usually we're dealing with real biological stuff. Organisms, organs, cells, and so on. So, we have a common, common governance which consists of a board of coordinating editors. We have common training, like this for instance. Uh, we have common architecture which consists of a simple top level ontology called BOFO, which includes a relation ontology, which is just the ontology related by ISA and part of the circle. Um, we have various principles that the ontology, there should be one ontology for each domain which we will recommend. And the, the, the trick is to bring an ontology to a state of stability and sophistication that we can recommend it. And that's hard, so we're slow. We are slow, but we are successful. We think we're successful. The terms are close to the language used by experts. Um, everything is evidence-based in the sense that the ontologies have to be used to annotate data. And they grow as the people who use them to annotate data say, I have this data, I don't have a term to annotate it, give me that term. Or, I have this data, you say I should annotate it using this term, but actually it's now clear that I need two terms, or seven terms. Please delete the original one term and substitute the seven terms. And you're dealing always with biologists at the other end of the line <coughs> who respond. Sometimes it takes a few days, sometimes it takes longer, but sometimes it takes a whole meeting. We have a strategy for motivating developers and users. And uh, the whole thing is revisable in a way which does not diminish its value. So people don't have to throw away old annotations because the ontology changed. And really that's the key. Because of, currently what happens is that either people just continue annotating with new and new versions without realizing that they're building an inconsistent body of data, or they say, oh, the gene ontology changed again. I'm going to build my own. Uh, these principles are all set forth. All the discussions about these principles are openly available. All our meetings are openly described. And, uh, we will have an OBO Foundry meeting as part of the ICBO meeting where we, re where we review the next four candidates for recommendation. Yes? How did you manage to get a disjoint set of domains? Um, the, 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 the Plato talked about the joints of reality. And Plato was no fool. I think well before in some ways. <laughs> uh, there are joints of reality. Proteins and RNA molecules and sequences and so forth. They are uh, stably demarcated domains of reality. And I don't think that's a problem. So uh, there was is there, there a no... consensus building to do it? Sorry? Was there any consensus building to do it? Well, it, here I think is where home setting comes in. So. The consensus building has been going on since the beginning of science. Science it, it has evolved in disciplines and subdisciplines, with corresponding journals and subjournals. And this creates a kind of map of the communities. Each community gradually needs an ontology. And it's amazing that the, the degree to which ontology needs have exploded just in the last few years. Um, the, the, but you don't, but the, so the, the, again, you get two kinds of ontology need. One is the ontology need for basic science, anatomy, RNA molecules. And the other is the ontology need for a project like OnStar. We are understanding that those two ontology needs need to be addressed in two different ways. Today I'm talking primarily about the reference ontology. But that implies that the resources are being created for an application purpose like OnStar. There will be gaps. On so will need to develop ontology resources of its own to fill those gaps. Um, there will never be a domain called OnStar, but OnStar may be a good ontology model. All right. Um, so the architecture of the OBO founder. This is the homestead. So homestead is the way in which people get to determine domains for ontology. 
And sometimes they will homestead Virginia. But somebody will say, we need West Virginia for this. And if they have good arguments and they do the work, they will get West Virginia. So, this is the original over foundry coverage. Along the uh, vertical axis, we have granularity. Very small things going up to very large things. Along the vertical axis, we have the closest thing to rocket science that you're going to get today, which is not very close. You have things, you have attributes, and you have processes or events. All of them entities. And I'd come back to uh, what the significance of this. Now, orthogonality, or non-redundancy, or modularity, they're all different words for the same thing. If we have non-redundant ontology modules, this means that annotation is additive. People use this ontology, and this ontology, and this ontology, or bits of that, and bits of that, and they do their annotations. They all add up. There's never any conflict, because they're all redundant. i sorry, they're all non-redundant. This is not true with SNOMED, even within SNOMED itself. It's certainly not true with the UMLS. It means you have a division of labor amongst the main experts, which again contributes to incentivization. You can incentivize the experts to care about the ontology because it's important for their domain. It means that the training in use of a given module is exportable to the other modules because they're all built on the same principle. So you, the, the, the need for ontology experts is very high. Once you've been trained in one ontology within the Ergo Foundry suite, you can move and use your training in another ontology. You can bring your knowledge of the first domain to bear on ensuring that there are no border disputes with the second domain, and so on. And we, we learn lessons, we document those lessons, and they, the, the lessons learned from one module can benefit all the other modules. And again, we maximize incentivization because the modules are all using each other. And so what, what the contributions you make to the, to the Go are recognized by the people working on the Pro. And this, so I've been uh, present from the start of the Ovo Foundry there have been many political disputes and wars, and, and even in the short six years, I believe, that, 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 actually, no, it's a long time, eight years, that, the, 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 that I talked earlier about enemies. There are people who don't like the other country. There are people who complain that it's too slow because we're so careful. But actually, the degree to which this method is being recognized and that people are trying to imitate it is amazing. It's, uh, it's, a, 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 it's surprising to me that people will be at least willing to pay lip service to the new something like this. All right. Um, now, because it's not just training, everybody involved in using these ontologies now knows how to use them all, which means they can more easily reuse them. It becomes easier to reuse than to build afresh. You trust what you reuse. That's important because it's run by experts who are watching each other to make sure they do it properly because they rely on each other. And we're learning all the time how to solve many of the problems which come with managing these ever-expanding bodies of, of resource by software. So we, we will never replace the manual element, but many things can be done by software and are being done more and more easily. And of course, there's more incentive to build software tools to help manage over foundry ontologies because the tools will automatically work with the other other foundry ontologies. And then we, we, an example of an in innovation is the Myriad strategy for creating application ontologies by importing from other ontologies. So the current foundry members, the official recognized ontologies, are in yellow. And... Um, these are the four ontologies which will be reviewed in public at the ICPO meeting. So the, I, my assumption is that these four ontologies will be uh, recognized as full members of the Yoga Foundry by the end of this year. And uh, I won't talk about the plant ontology. I will talk briefly about OB, since this is relevant to your OnStar needs. 
Um, I'll then talk about, there's a misprint there, not ogums, but ogums. Um, and then I'll briefly mention the infectious disease ontology for our CDC representatives in the room. So, this is the OBO family modular organization from a slightly different level. The top level is basic formal ontology, which I'll talk about soon. Basic formal ontology is designed to be a very small, highly abstract organizing device. In the mid level, we have the information artifact ontology, which contains terms like data, database, um, word, sentence, paper, uh, protocol, so forth. OB, which contain, OB is the ontology for biomedical investigations, which contains terms like uh, experiment, equipment, analyte, and so forth. And then OGMS contains terms like disease, symptom, uh, treatment, and so forth. And then we have the ontologies that we've been talking about earlier, uh, organized in the way that I described. Now, OB, you can find documented here. Um, its purpose is to address <coughs> the, the, the need that experimenters have in areas like gene array experimentation, where the precise way in which the experiment is set up determines the meaning of the data. So you can't understand the results of a gene array experiment unless you know exactly what staining was used and what statistics were used and so on. So OB provides a controlled vocabulary for describing all of those things which affect the meaning of data, the scientific meaning of data, coming out of particularly biomedical investigation. And it's a, co a collaboration of a large number of uh, experimental uh, initiatives, primarily in the area of genomics. Uh, so there are toxicogenomics and transcriptomics and nutrigenomics and neurogenetics. All of these people have representatives who are working on OB. It's a very, very large-scale, coordinated effort. And uh, it's, it's very, very high-level... Um, sophistication in the degree to which it tries to be completely up to date in the technology it uses. So it's the closest we have to a new owl ontology which is useful for supporting scientific research. The, the OBA foundry was born by taking the go and spreading out. Some of the spreading incorporated existing ontologies. OBO is an example of a new ontology which was built to the OBO foundry specifications. Uh, this is just a, uh, a, the kind of thing that you can do. So you have, you're doing an experiment on mice. Uh, you're collecting specimens from organisms. So you have an, a mouse which plays a specimen role. Um, you have an analyte uh, which is uh, in, an analyte role which inheres in glucose molecules. So you're going to analyze some glucose molecules which are part of a blood specimen which is contained in this particular device. And you have a glucometer which has a specified input which is going to be this uh, specimen and a specified output which is going to be a datum. You have a process which is the analyte assay the glucometer realizes a certain function, which is to measure. And this function inheres in this other device, and so on. So we do this. We have the terms to do this for every kind of screening or analysis, or both analysis of biological specimens and analysis of data. So we do the same kind of, of, of um, cartoon for statistics. Now, this is already huge. You can imagine how many processes there are, how many roles there are for different kinds of equipment, um, how many kinds of outputs there are, how many kinds of inputs there are. So OB is already a very large ontology. And this, this is just a fragment. So we have planned processes. For instance, an investigation is itself a planned process. An assay is a planned process. Uh, the processing of material, staining, it's a planned process. 
You might be manufacturing material or you might be containing material. So they are two kinds of material processing plant processing. And we have hundreds of those. And similarly, uh, uh, we have information content entities like reports, figures, plan specifications, cell cultures, and so on. So you can see the idea. And um, every term in OB has its own website. So the terms themselves are really equivalent to web addresses. And on the website, you get the definitions of the term, examples of usage, editor notes, um, the relations they can stand in, both as the subject and as the object. So this is really very, very technically done. All of that is computer processing. So this is what the computer sees. This is what the human being sees. It's the same website. And that, that is the way we need to do ontology if we're going to maintain the uniqueness of terms and definitions. URIs give a guaranteed uniqueness. And they allow versioning to be maintained because the old versions get new numbers. As it um, now, OGMS, the Ontology for General Medical Science. And OGMS is in two versions, one an OBA version, the other an OWL version. You find them here. Um, OGMS has already spawned various initiatives, so we have a vital science ontology which is being developed in, con in conjunction with a uh, medical device company, which is interested in interface <laughs> interfacing medical device uh, outputs. Um, we have a demographics ontology which is going to be part of an EHR ontology resource, probably an application ontology. <coughs> We have infectious disease ontology, which I'm going to talk about briefly at the end. And we have a mental health ontology, which has also um, an emotional ontology, and we're going to have a behavior ontology, drug abuse ontology, uh, which will be part of that method. Um, so let's look at the um, uh, problem. So, Jorps Landgraver, who was a refugee from the HL7 community, described our organs as the best ontology effort in the whole biomedical domain by far. So you heard it here first. Uh, the, um, the, the idea I've already made clear uh, almost ad nauseam so far, but let me just repeat it from a slightly different perspective. So we have information artifacts, which are the results of observation processes, for instance, in medicine, or in, in investigating analytes. You get reports, you get data on your screen or printed out. They are information artifacts. You get the processes of observation, acts of observation, which are, uh, uh, for instance, observing a patient or taking a pulse. And then you get the entities observed, the pulse of the patient. Now, we're trying to get those three things clear. HL7 runs them together for its own reasons. We're trying to keep them carefully separate. And the, the, the job of doing that is going to be influenced by all three of those ontologies, the mid-level ontologies that I, I uh, showed you in the uh, over foundry structure. So we have the basic formal ontology at the top. Extending basic formal ontology are IAO, OB, and OGMS, and then we have the foundry bio-ontologies like we go at the bottom. So let's look at buffer. Um, the, the, notice the colors here. We have things, attributes, processes. In buffer speak, that means we have independent continuance, dependent continuance, and occurrence. Now why do we use these fancy terms? because we want to keep the terms in the upper ontology completely neutral as between all the lower ontologies. The, the, there are other competing upper ontologies like Sumo or Psyche or Dolce, but they, all of them make the mistake of being too big and they include within the upper ontology terms which the lower ontologies believe they own. And the problem which arises is that the upper ontology is almost certainly not going to be an expert on cells, for instance, which is a term in sumo. And they will get cell wrong. And then people in cell biology will say, I can't use that. So 
So we, we maintain buffer as a completely separate, higher level stratum, which is guaranteed not to overlap with anything below. Um, so you see how the organization of the 13 original states flows from the buffer top level. Examples of these three uh, terms are the three root nodes of the three gene ontologies. So the structure of buffo and the structure of go are, they grew, they grew up in tandem with each other in a way. And then we have the types, types of thing, types of quality, types of event, and then we have the instances down here. Now, um, already we have many users of Buffo, so we have a user group with 120 members, which is very, very active. And we're providing documentation for different types of users, and we are providing a methodology, which I'm going to describe very briefly, for new users to, to take Buffo as a resource for starting ontology building. Um, the methodology is really is very simple. You can import Buffo Owl into Protégé, and then it Buffo Owl gives you the top level guaranteed, and then you just choose your starting point. For the cell ontology, the starting point is obvious, it's object, because each cell is an object. And then you start importing your cell biology terms as children of object. And then you get a guaranteed consistency with other Buffo ontologies, of which there are now many. And you also get the clues to how you should understand what a cell is. So a cell has to satisfy the definition of object, which you will find in the buffer uh, specification. So, you import buffer into your ontology editor, you work with your domain experts to create an initial mid-level classification using buffer as your guide. You find the 50 most common used, commonly used terms corresponding to the subtypes of those um, initial mid-level terms, and you, you work out an informal is a hierarchy. And always following this guide, A is a B means every instance of A is an instance of B. So that's the universality principle. And you, you need to be aware of what your domain is. So if your domain is naturally occurring lungs, then every lobe of lung is a part of a lung. If your domain is lung specimens, then that's not going to be true. So if you need the domain specification very explicit. So, and we have many users. Here are just some users which you can find on the Buffo website. Um, all of the Oboe Foundry ontologies use Buffo, and uh, other other agencies, some of which I can't mention, use Buffo. Um, now, we're, we're doing biology here. So, continuance. Why do we call them continuance? Because they continue. So, you continue to exist. You continue to exist, to my knowledge, for at least three hours. And you probably existed before that. And you will probably exist for a longer period. You continue. You are identity. And it's the same you. You were once a fetus. Now, that's not true of hand waves. There's no way in which I can preserve a hand wave. Hand waves do not continue to exist, they occur. <coughs> and there are good metaphysical reasons why we distinguish continuance from occurrence. There are many differences between continuance and occurrence. Now, you are a continuum. Your temperature is a continuum. Your temperature changes. The change in your temperature is an occurrence. <coughs> but your temperature itself changes. You have the same temperature now as you have when you were a fetus. That, that's another thing which is near to rocket science, but not very near. And I'll explain what I mean later. I realize this is something popular. But think of it. You have your temperature, and you have the changes in your temperature, history of your temperature, as it goes up and down. Same with your height. Same with your mass. Same with your specific gravity. They're all dependent continuum. Your temperature is your temperature. I cannot have your temperature. I can have an exactly similar temperature. So, continues continue to exist through time. 
and there are independent continuants, and there are independent continuants which have qualities, attributes, shapes, and so forth. And then there are processes. Your life is a process. Your temperature's history is a process. If you have a disease, this is, this is another piece of 1% fraction rocket science. Your disease is a continuum, but your disease course is an occurrence. Anything which can exist through time while undergoing changes is a, is a continuum. So this is a chart representing how your temperature changes. How, how someone else's temperature changes. So we, we, we're moving down slowly. Temperature is a quality. Quality is a continuum. And we have instances down here. The John is an instance of organism, and John's temperature is an instance of temperature, not rocket science. And temperature inheres in the bearer of the temperature, which is an organism. This is still bottle. Yeah. The temperature is not in bottle, but the inherence relation is in bottle. Now, John's temperature changes through time. So John's temperature at time T1 instantiates the subtype of 37 degrees Celsius temperature. At a later time, it instantiates a different subtype. So this is one instance which continues to exist through time. But at different times, it instantiates different subtypes of temperature, always instantiating the temperature type. And John himself instantiates different subtypes of the type human. So for a time, I, I have a funny view about embryos, but I think John was once an embryo. Uh, he became a fetus. Um, and then he was a newborn, and then he was an infant, and then he was a child, and then he was an adult. None of this is rocket science, is it? Um, so temperature subtypes and development mental stage subtypes, these are threshold divisions. They don't correspond to any sharp boundaries. There's a continuous flow, you know, or a continuous growth. Um, and it depends upon the needs of your experiment, really, how many subtypes you want to distinguish, how many subtypes of temperature you want to distinguish. So we have John's temperature, which is an instance of the type temperature, and we have John's temperature history, which is an instance of the type course of temperature changes, which is a process. And we have John's life, which is an instance of the subtype life of an organism of the type of process. And now we come to another type of dependent continuum. Um, so we've talked about qualities, temperature, mass, and so forth. Um, we talked a little bit about functions when I talked about the function of the measurement device is to measure. The function of your heart is to pump, or one of the functions. Functions, too, are continuous. So when you, were, when you first began to exist, or when your heart first began to exist, its function was to pump. The function of your heart was the function of your heart, which is exactly similar to the function of my heart, but still, your function and my function are two different instances of the type pump function. That function continues to exist through the life of your heart. As long as you have a heart, its function is to pump, and its function is your function. So function is another example of dependent continuum with instances in reality. Instances which depend on independent continuums which are their bearers. Now, analyte role the role of an analyte in an experiment is also a dependent continuum. Something has an analyte role because we designate this thing to be the analyte. We give it the role. And once we give it the role, it has that role for a certain period of time. We gave Obama the president role. So roles are dependent continuums. And um, student role, patient role, clinician role, professor role, and so forth. These are all examples of roles in the buffer of sense. So this is 
buffer. Yeah, there's, there's a little bit more, but not much more. And then dispositions. So dispositions, uh, fragility is an example of a disposition. Uh, human males have a disposition to lose their hair. Um, now, roles are optional, and roles are a product of designation, assignment. Dispositions are physical. You have a disposition because of your physical makeup, and they're not optional. If you have them, you, you can't lose them by declaring that you don't have them. A disposition can cease to exist, but only if the bearer or the bearer's environment is physically changed. So you might change a glass by changing the molecular structure so that it's no longer fragile. But as long as the glass has the molecular structure that it has, and it's in the kind of normal physical environment that glasses are in on the surface of the Earth, then it's fragile. The disposition gets realized in a process, breaking the process going bald. And the disposition occurs when there are some corresponding physical circumstances. Either inside the cranium or inside the skin of the head or wherever grow, hair growing processes are steered or inside the, um, the restaurant where the glass breaks. So the, and the realization will depend upon the physical makeup of the bearer. The follicles have certain properties in virtue of which the balding process takes its course in a specific way. So dispositions have realizations. Dispositions are continuous, realizations are current processes. I'm saying all this because dis diseases are dispositions. And uh, we're going to work quite a lot on disease very soon. So we have functions to see or to come. The function of John's eye is to see. John's seeing is a process of seeing which realizes the function. So functions have realizations. Dispositions have realizations. Roles have realizations. The realization of the analyte role is to be analyzed. The realization of the pumping role is pumping. The realization of the seeing function is seeing. So none of this is rocket science. It's just careful Careful. Yeah. So, Ogham's starts from where I just stopped. It's a, an ontology for representing a very high level ontology. So, Ogham's is about 200 terms, and we don't want it to get much larger. It's being extended by much larger ontologies within the electronic health record domain. But the Ogham's itself is designed to be a small organized <coughs> ontology. And the fundamental idea is that a disease is a disposition rooted in some physical, now the word disorder here means some physical changed badness in an organism. We're going to work through the message here. And we're trying to get clarity about disease etiology, which is one kind of occurrence, disease progression, which is another kind of occurrence, and then cure would be a, yet another kind of occurrence. Clarity about the relationship between the disease and the process of diagnosis, where many ontologies in this field actually confuse disease with diagnosis. I'm not going to mention SNOMED at this point, but I could mention ICD. Um, we want to get clarity about the relationship between phenotypes and signs and symptoms, clinical signs and symptoms. With the, there is a lot of vagueness there. I'm not sure that anyone can get clarity, but we're trying. And then we want to get clear about the distinction between all of that and the observations. So, a physical disorder is something that goes bad. So, here you're healthy, but then something goes bad and you have a change in some organ or some cell. Yes? And um, the, the, the proposition is that every disease is a disposition in some physical disorder. So, that your body is physically disordered. Therefore, you have a disease. This is true even for mental diseases. Every disease has an underlying physical disorder. And if you think that the word disorder should be reserved for some other purposes, then just think of this as being a physical badness, physical ill structure. Physical, it's a, a part of the body which is 
dissolved. Uh, it might be dissolved because it's been uh, affected by pathogens which are inside the organism. <coughs> now, a, a, a physical disorder is an independent continuum. It's a part of your body which continues to exist for a certain period of time. It's like the heart, it's just a disordered part. And um, it's linked to other parts of the organism in just the same way that the organs are linked to other parts of the organism. It's just abnormal. It's not doing its work. Maybe it's um, too large. Now, it's abnormal in a quite specific clinical sense. And um, the, the word clinical is deliberately chosen here because this has something to do with reasons for going to the clinic. And we believe that the, the, the I nearly said concept then. <laughs> See how careful I am. <laughs> well, the way we understand the term disease depends upon certain environmental features, essentially. There is no way in which we're going to get a natural kind called disease which is completely free of these dependencies. So disease is not a part of the joints of nature, as it were. And you can see this if you think about phenomena like marathon running. When you run a marathon, this will have consequences which look very much like a disease, but you don't think that you're sick because you just run a marathon, you deliberately run a marathon. Similarly, when you're pregnant, there are some aspects of what you experience which look very much like a disease. You don't think of pregnancy as a disease because it's part of the life plan for an organism of your type. So, disease is subject to these threshold phenomena. It's not part of, sorry, the, to, a process is clinically abnormal only if it's not part of the life plan for an organism of the relevant type. So, aging is not easy. Unless it occurs at the age of three. I think it can become very old at the age of three. Uh, it, has, it, it has to be causally linked to an elevated risk, either of pain or of other feelings of illness, or of death, or of dysfunction. So you could have a disease without having any experienced symptoms, but there has to be a, an elevation of your risk of dying. Hypertension is an example of, a, of a, something which is clinically abnormal, but not associated with any symptom. And it has to be such that this risk is above a certain threshold level, and the threshold level may vary in, in societies, or in environments, or with persons of different types. Some people are, are tough. Some people are weak. And what is above the threshold level for one kind of person may not be above the threshold level for another kind of person. This is part of the territory when understanding disease, because disease is a threshold phenomenon. Also, it's part of the territory in terms of time. If you have influenza for five minutes, or does that even make sense to say that you have influenza for five minutes? If you have a strong immune system, and your influenza is eliminated within five minutes, if that makes sense. Did you ever have influenza? This is the kind of phenomenon that we're dealing with, where these kinds of questions arise inevitably. But still, we can define disease. So Barry, yes. Um, so when you come across situations like uh, sickle cell disease, yes, which is an evolutionary change in a way to protect against malaria, yeah, there we go. Yeah. right? So in the regions where malaria is very prevalent, it is actually a, a benefit, you know. Yeah. And in, in, you know, uh, in so cases, this is uh, exactly, the, 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 this is the, probably the best illustration of the problem that we're dealing with when defining a term like disease. So I don't think it's, it, it, I don't think it's a problem for the approach. On the contrary, I think it proves that the approach works. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is the big picture. You are healthy. You, some small disturbance at the cellular or molecular level begins. It does not manifest itself clinically. There are no signs or symptoms. You don't feel pain. You constantly are carrying out self-assessment. No signs, no symptoms. Go, you go back to the business of life. And then one day, you carry out the self-assessment, you feel a pain. So the disorder has become more pronounced. You have now have a clinical manifestation. 
is sufficient that you go to the doctor. The doctor carries out a physical exam. He actually identifies the disorder within your body, physical part of your body. And um, has a preliminary clinical finding, which leads him to a preliminary clinical picture, which leads him to order uh, a lab test. He takes a specimen isolation. The clinical picture gets more um, refined through an interpret interpretive process until he gets to a diagnosis which leads in turn to a patient management plan, which leads to treatment, and again we have a circle here as the treat treatment involves this interpretive process meaning to be repeated until you finally get the treatment which works and then you're healthy. Yes, so when does a disorder transition to a disease? That is a not, a, a not allowed, that question. So, <laughs> when, I, I don't know, you well enough to know whether you are a good person to address this question to, but when will he become bald? <laughs> there is no answer. Uh, well, actually, you're a better case, I think. <laughs> I think probably he is already bald. <laughs> There's highly. Um, disease is like baldness. There is no answer to the question, when did he become bald? And when do we represent a disorder as a disease? So you need to do both kinds of work. And this is clear because there are disorders which are not associated with diseases. For instance, a healed amputation stump or a missing, you lose a finger. You, you, there, there, there's certainly a disorder here. There is no, not necessarily a disease. So you need to record both in any case, as soon as you can, basically. But for every disease, I believe, you will never ever be able to record the disease until relatively late in its evolution, because there's a lot of pre clinical uh, processing going on before it reaches the point of clinical manifestation. Increasingly, we'll be able to identify things earlier because we'll have more, even very early, if you have babies to work with. Um, but you'll be able to identify things by means of chemical tests. But typically, you won't recognize the disease until late because the patient, the, the, the organism will go to the doctor only relatively late. Yeah, so that, that brings up a lot of issues. Say, for example, atherosclerosis, we all know, starts at the age of, say, 80, 20 in small phase. And those researchers who are doing, if they do some certain tests, they can say, oh, yes, yes, the atherosclerotic clock has already started. So they will say the disease process has started. I think that they are probably uh, right to say that. Mm. But the disease, so that we'll, we'll come back to that. Sure. So, the, the, there is going to, in order that you have a disorder, there is almost certainly going to be some etiological process. And where you, where you say that the etiological process stops and the disease course starts is the baldness question. But you can see clearly that certain process are, processes are etiological and certain other processes are disease processes. So e e even though you can't know where the exact border is, you can still be clear that some things are in front and other things are behind. Yeah, but in the situations we deal with, sometimes a disorder may never become a disease. That's fine, that's part of the picture. Yeah, that's, that's part, part of the picture. Yeah. In yeah. fact, we're all, all of us, subject to multiple disorders at every stage in our lives, but most of those disorders don't manifest as diseases, fortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the picture is perfectly all right, now every single one of the terms that you see here is defined in audience. And I mean defined very carefully, it's a lot of work. And the, this is what Landgraber was getting at when he said that this was a good piece of work. Because if you look at the definitions of these terms in the ICD or in, in, in the literature or in SNOMED or in any of the other existing resources, you will find that they are not very good. So they are of the form of a disease is a lack of, a lack of health or a lack of social or environmental or personal health or something like that. It really is useless. Well, this is very, very carefully built up following all the principles I described, formally and in natural language terms, in order to have a, a, a firm benchmark for developing all the other disease-related ontologies that we're going to need. One of the other things I think we need to be very uh, careful about is 
the use of the word disease and disorder in yes. medicine. Yes. It's fairly loose. So yes, so I tend to intermix the two. So this is a case of where prospective standardization kicks in. The idea is that the people who want to follow organs should join the organs effort if they don't if they really are convinced that they don't they can't accept the use of disorder to mean a physical balance. There is the best <laughs> definition underneath, but then they have to make a case for an alternative, and we would really like to have an alternative because we're all aware that there is this problem, particularly in the mental field. Disorder is used traditionally for good reasons to mean something quite different from what we have in mind. So, but you have to have an alternative, and um, we will. So, the, the, all of this is completely collaborative and open. If you want to join the the problem, you are part of the yeah. ecosystem. Good, so a pathological process is a bodily process that is a manifestation of a disorder and is clinically abnormal. And a disease is a disposition to undergo pathological processes that exist in an organism because of one or more disorders in that organism. So that's the natural understanding. And the disposition is doing a lot of work. So let's see how it works by looking at cirrhosis, first of all. So here the etiological process is phenobarbital-induced hepatic cell death. This produces a disorder, which is a necrotic liver, which bears a disposition called cirrhosis, which is realized in pathological processes of abnormal tissue repair, and so on, which produces abnormal bodily features which are recognized as symptoms of fatigue and anorexia and signs of jaundice and an enlarged spleen. Symptoms are what you can experience, signs are what the doctor can measure or test. Or do. Uh, we do that, we're doing that now for multiple diseases. Um, we're, so in other words, we're unfolding the normal disease course into stages and features like symptoms and signs. And what we want to do in the future is to map the disease course the normal disease course, together with disease courses under various standard treatments, various drugs. So the idea is to collaborate with, the, with the pharmaceutical researchers to study the effects of drugs in a systematic way using the algorithm's template, the big picture, as the, uh, the starting point. Now, one of the things that we, we can do now is to distinguish two kinds of dispositions. There are dispositions and there are predispositions. A predisposition is a disposition to a disposition. And there are many, dis many predispositions to disease which people have without having the disease. So a predisposition to a disease is a disposition in an organism that constitutes an increased risk of the organism subsequently developing some disease. And we can see how this works with uh, HNPCC, here the etiological process is inheritance of a mutant mismatch repair gene which produces a disorder which is chromosome 3 with abnormal HMLH1 which bears the disposition called Lynch syndrome which is a disease, a Lynch syndrome which some people get but you don't have to get which is realized in pathological processes of abnormal repair of DNA mismatches which produces the disorder called that, which is realized in symptoms including pain, and which this disorder bears a disposition which is another disease, which is non-polyposis colon cancer. So you can have Lynch syndrome without having non-polyposis colon cancer, but if you do have Lynch syndrome, then you have a disposition to get non-polyposis. And then Huntington's disease is another example um, where the, the disposition is a surefire disposition. In other words, if you live long enough, then you will get the disease. Or you will be recognized as having the disease, as we should say. And um, so this is hypertension. Uh, here the etiological process is abnormal reabsorption of uh, sodium chloride by the kidney. The disorder is an abnormally large scattered molecular aggregate of salt in the blood which bears the disposition called hypertension, which is realized in pathological processes of exertion of abnormal pressure against the arterial wall, 
which produces abnormal bodily features which are recognized as headache, dizziness, and elevated blood pressure. Um, so hypertension doesn't necessarily have to have symptoms, but it does have often symptoms of headache and dizziness. Perhaps eventually it always has those symptoms. And then we do diabetes in the same way. Oh, uh, yes, sorry. So we, we, there's this lack of knowledge, incomplete medicine, but yeah. right, that we don't know until I get some of those. So, so is it how you represent that, that we exactly don't know the cause for say, that? So it's a multifactorial Good. disease. So this is a, um, a, a, the other side of the coin um, of the principle of low-hanging fruit. The principle of low-hanging fruit says that we should write down what we know incorporated into the ontology from the very start. We can't write down everything because there are many things we don't know. But the ontology um, uh, architecture, I suppose is the word, the way in which an ontology is built is designed to do justice to the fact that we are often know very little and then gradually we learn more. So the, the, the general rule here is that if you don't know what something is, for instance here, the cause of disease X, then you annotate to the lowest node within the ontology where you do know what it is. And that means that all of the knowledge you have is incorporated, but you're not claiming anything that you do not know. And it means that you can gracefully extend the ontology when you do know. That this is in contrast with what was the common view until recently, and still is the view built into the ICD, which is that if you don't know, then you add an unknown term. And the problem with that is that the unknown terms change meaning each time you know a little bit more here. The, the meaning of unknown becomes changed because some of what is unknown is known. So the, um, the ontology approach is designed to enable data to be accumulated. And when I'm writing these things down for those cases where we do know, but the, exactly the same strategy can be applied also to the cases where we don't. So for example here, the ecological process, the way the books describe at the moment would be, say, uh, type 2 diabetic, diabetes mellitus is a multifactorial disease. Multifactorial disease. And then abnormalities like they had uh, reduced insulin Data and all of that. So, how would you put that? Uh, you, here, you are represented that as ecological process produces. So, we don't know the ecological processes. So, you just put it as ecological processes produces. Actually, I, I think probably we dealt with it in exactly the way we should deal with it. Given that we don't know what the etiological process is, we just put etiological process. There must be some etiological process. Things don't happen by magic. So, not even magic. <laughs> so, so would you further go further step and say, um, like unknown, I mean at this time, so you don't feel the need to? No, the ontology method stops you from doing it. Um, the, the reason why it stops you is truly because we want to create a maximum stability and therefore maximum value of the knowledge that you embed into the annotation system through time. And if you put unknown explicit explicitly into the annotation resource, you have to change it every time some bit is known, and you'll never know precisely how those changes influence what you had earlier. The ICD is, is for this reason, alone problematic to an unknown degree. So here, the representation is in it, some iterative <coughs> process produces type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Okay. So you just annotate to the lowest node for which you can annotate. And it may be right at the very top, maybe just a current or entity. And it's always right. It, it's not helpful for a human being because a human being will have suspicions about something like that. It's always right and it serves the computer's needs. So this comes in when the final diagnosis is made. So we have to think about types and instances. This is a representation of type, a type. The typical 
set of occurrence which includes a disease course of type 2 diabetes. But every instance may be different. Um, it may be that the, the patient has other diseases which complicate things. Right. So the instance story and the type story are two different things. And the types, the, the, the strategy here is that we, we describe the types by looking at the typical case. And that creates a language which is uh, very useful for dealing with many cases, but it's also useful for dealing with the other non-typical cases because we can say deviates from type 2 diabetes because of <coughs> such and such. And this is, this is again the, the way we deal with lobe of lung, part of lung. So lobe of lung, part of lung is universally true for healthy, canonical, typical mammals. Uh, but it's not true for some. I, I, I didn't know whether there are people with free hanging lobes, but uh, non-lobed lobes. Uh, but it's certainly true when we take specimens. But that's not a typical case. All right, hypersensitivity to penicillin, anybody? Mm -hmm. Any, any, any demand? Uh, now let's do a little bit more on disease course. So if you look at the coronary heart disease, you get pictures like this, which are very much like the big picture I just described. Um, remember that we have the disease, which is a disposition, and we have the disease course, which is the aggregate of processes in which the disease disposition is realized. Now that disease course will be very different in different patients. Some will take drugs, some will not take drugs, some will take drugs correctly, some will not take, will take drugs incorrectly, uh, some will die on, in a traffic accident before they, and so on. So the disease course will be typical, described on the type level, but then the instances will vary a lot. And uh, the, the, what we want to look now is at the disease course of coronary heart disease. And here again, John has coronary heart disease. He has very early on early lesions of small fibrous plaques which no one knows about. This is his heart disease already. Then gradually he has asymptomatic infarction and then he has surface disruption of plaques. Somewhere around here there will be a clinical manifestation. And um, I need the power. Um, and then gra gradually still uh, uh, gradually he will then undergo treatment and what was his unstable angina as a result of treatment becomes stable angina and he lives with the drugs for the rest of his life and that is a typical disease course we want to create so, one typical disease. We want to create, for each disease, multiple such typical disease courses reflecting certain kinds of standard patient management. And we do that, we, we, we use those typical disease courses then to annotate data about different patients. Um, and in this way, we have a, 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 a control vocabulary for describing highly complex clinical phenomena of a sort which doesn't exist yet in the repertoire of uh, control vocabularies. Just wondering, in this instance, um, where did disorder get disorder versus disease? So, th that's a good question. The, the, the slide, I, I realize now, is not, well, uh, is not well described. So, here, I'm actually describing a disorder or a collection of disorders. Here, I'm describing a disease course or process. So what I should do is disease at the stage where it is associated with early lesions and small fibrous plaques, disease at the stage where it is associated with asymptomatic infarction, disease at the stage, and so on. So that, 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 that was a good point to see if we get an extra point. I'm going to change it as we speak. Um, Not all of them, I'll just do this one. I 
I thought this was a good slide. I now realize it's a good slide. <laughs> yeah. But I thought you said it was a disorder at that point. So, no. The, well, actually, that, that's the boldness question. So, you know, we just... So, where, whether we call him John's coronary heart, where, where does John's coronary heart disease begin? I think pretty much here. Uh, here. Um, but it may be that cardiac uh, clinicians say, no, it's not disease until there is surface disruption. Here, here it's just the rough and tumble heart pumping life. But I, my feeling is that it's here. So it's already a disease here. And the dis disorder is manifested through early lesions and small fibrous plaques. But there's more going on in the heart underneath that. So these are just service phenomena. They are disorders. So the, 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 you're right. I made several mistakes on this slide. Um, but now I know how to fix it. All right. Um, so I think the bottom line is that there will always be ambiguity. Mm -hmm. No, the bottom line is that we always have to be careful to get rid of the ambiguities. <laughs> no, we really need to work on just these kinds of issues because no one did. And that's why, so I said we have to be focused on reality, the reality on the side of the patient. We shouldn't be focused on what SNOMED says, we shouldn't be focused on what Eclipse says, we should be focused on the reality on the side of the patient. Painstakingly carefully. Why? Because if we create some new sloppy standard, no one will have any reason to follow it. Even if it's successful, it will just be some new standard. What we have to do is to create a benchmark, which everyone will see is the way to go. And if the way to go involves ambiguity, it's not the way to go. But eventually, since it's used by humans, there's going to be some interpretation difference. That's why we, this is a never-ending thing. So all of us have to commit our lives forever <laughs> to keeping these things under careful observation. Yes? The, I'm still confused a bit about the branding or representing a disease and differentiating it from the different disorder. Yes. So here, in the instantiates of T1, where there is a kind of like a fibrous block or a block, is, from a perspective, you are saying it's a disease, even though the underlying problem is a disorder. It's always the disorder which is the underlying problem. So you have a disorder. The disorder may be just a passing influenza. It goes away. Or it may be something like this, and it stays and gets worse. Well. There's always a disorder. The disease, but the disorder need not manifest itself. That's in the case of influenza. The disorder has the disposition to manifest itself. That disposition is the disease. And the reason why we say the disease is the disposition is because the disposition is what is common through all of the different realizations. Whether you take drugs or not take the drug, you still have the disposition. Whether you die in a traffic accident or don't die in a traffic accident, you still have the disposition. So the disease causes are different in different patients, but the disposition to these typical uh, eventualities is, is what is the disease. That's what the drug companies are trying to cure. That's what we complain about. That's what's listed in the lexicon. Yes? But you can see why there's a difficulty in consensus. Because some people say high cholesterol is a disease, elevated cholesterol, versus the time you get the plaques, then that's really the disease. So I'm just yeah. Saying, so I, I, I think, consensus. and that's why I insist that we shouldn't worry about when baldness begins. Yeah. So, that's so the wrong so question to ask. So, so I think. Also, you're, and it's hard for us not to kind of keep thinking about what the interpretation of a clinician to say when the disease starts and when the health insurance. Yeah, you shouldn't. Yeah. So That's the health insurance that, yeah. problem. It's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it, it, it's, it's like, if you're calling this a disease, how many clinicians will call that? Okay, so I, I can fix that. So uh, I... Um, First of all, I can give, I can produce this slide to talk about the disorder by changing unstable angina, stable angina. Point so I can, that, there I'm safe because there's no claim when the disease begins. Right. 
Um, I can add cholesterol. And then I, where the disease begins, I can put a big question mark on the left hand end and then the right hand end is blocked. All right, I want to spend the next three minutes talking about IDO. So, uh, IDO is the infectious disease ontology. The infectious disease ontology is the most successful of the Ollum's extension ontologies. And it was funded by the uh, um, NIAID, which is really because it's the infectious disease. Um, three years ago, for a specific Staph aureus related project, run uh, by Lindsay Cowell, who is now at the University of Texas Southwest Medical Center of Dallas. And uh, the idea is that we take organs and we create IDO by modification of the organs term with infectious. Now, that, that's, it's not, it doesn't work quite so easily because of prions and because of all these other problems. But that you can see how we create IDO from organs. And then... IDO is a, is a kind of infectious disease ontology template which is being used in multiple IDO extensions for specific infectious diseases. So we have IDO malaria, IDO influenza, IDO staph, and so on. And each of those takes IDO and then adds new terms or specializes terms in such a way that they apply to that specific disease case. So um, let me just, this is a list of the uh, uh, the groups who are developing IDO extensions. So we have an influenza, which is the influenza ontology. We have a, 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 the IMBB vector-based consortium, which is developing IDO malaria, IDO mal. We have the dengue fever ontology at Colorado State University. We have TB and staff ontologies at Duke and now at Texas. Uh, the, is the Cleveland Clinic still doing infective endocarditis? Or no, I'm, I'm moving it myself. Okay, so that, he, he is doing infective endocarditis. Um, the, we have a big group now doing the brucellosis ontology. We're, we're just fighting with them to keep the acronym BO, which they want to use for IDO group, but we want to keep for behavior ontology. You see, they got that first, and there is also a certain home setting of acronyms. And then we're developing in Buffalo and in Texas, so Lindsay moved to Texas, the HIV ontology. Um, and this, the strategy is, in each case, the same. We take IDA, which is a, a very, very well-crafted set of terms for all aspects of infectious disease. But it contains only those terms that are common to infectious diseases, terms like host and pathogen and so forth, uh, many of which are roles. So host and pathogen are both roles. And it defines them logically and then gives them to the di different disease communities who then extend them for their needs. And that's a difficult management operation because people don't always extend properly. But we're working on solving the uh, problems of massive multidisciplinary coordination um, step by step in order to make sure that we do this job properly. And just let's see how it works for influenza. So we have. The etiological process, which is the infection of airway epithelial cells with influenza virus, produces a disorder, which is viable cells with the influenza virus. This disorder, and you see those, that disorder could exist without the disease. But that, that disorder bears the disposition of flu, which is realized in pathological processes of acute inflammation, which produce, produces abnormal body, the features recognized as weakness, dizziness, and fever. And then, the nice thing is that in the case of influenza, the disorder also induces normal physiological processes of the immune response. So here we have a disease which brings its own cure along with it. So the disease course here typically includes the, I wouldn't say treatment, but the response. And so this is going to be one particular way in which the standard disease course template that we're going to produce for influenza will be will include not just results of treatment, but also results of self-induced response. And that was the end.
So that, so this is an interesting question which has to do with the etiology of that particular slide, which was not, I didn't make that slide. Um, the slide was actually a, re a cartoon representing an instance. It was not a cartoon representing type, because of course there is glucose, which is not a part of blood. So you're right, that, and that, that is um, something which we need to take much more care about. I've been naming stealing slides from friends. Um, so so I, am, I am responsible for the heart cardiac plaque mistake, but I'm not responsible for the yeah, But still the question is, uh, how, like, say, for example, if I, I have to define, say, sinusidum to a plasma phenyl aluminum level. So a plasma phenyl aluminum level. If I have to define that in relation to the blood, I even plasma glucose, relation to the blood, the relation what we've been using is part of. Yeah. And so that's it's a very high granular level. So first of all, there are two part of relations. There's the instance level part of. Your your heart is part of you. And there is the type level part of heart part of human or heart part of man. Um, I think that the we need to talk carefully about what you need in the way of more granular part of relations. But whatever you need, you need to keep track of both the instance level and the type level. And the reason that you need to do that is because some of some relations in ontology are such that what is obviously true at the level of instances is no longer true at the level of types. And I'll give you an example. Um, which I've forgotten the example, but I'll, I'll make one up, which may be physiologically incorrect. A adjacency is a relation, adjacency of body parts. And it's true at the level of instances that every uterine tract, and this is maybe wrong, every uterine tract adjacent to uh, some urinary bladder. If that holds at an instance, then the urinary bladder is trivially adjacent to the uterine tract. It's not true at the level of types. Because while it may be true that every uterine tract is adjacent to some urinary bladder, it's not true that every urinary bladder is adjacent to some uterine tract. So males don't have uteruses. So the, 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 the adjacency is symmetric at the level of instances. It's not symmetric at the level of types. There are many, many other cases like that. Simul occurs simultaneously with. It's always true. It's always reflect the symmetric at the level of instances. But it may not be reflexive at the level of um, types. And, um, so these are cases where the inverse relationship automatically does not apply. Right? Uh, is it the case of males? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even at the instance level, the same thing is true. No, because if, at, well, <laughs> So, if so, every instance of male uh, bladder is found at just Yeah, that's right, that's yeah. right. But at the level of instances, you have the following assertion, which is universally true. If uterine tract adjacent to urinary bladder, then urinary bladder adjacent to uterine tract. Right. That's universally true. It's true in males, too. It's just never, the, the, the left hand side is never realized right. in males. So that's the problem. And the problem is that computers don't realize that there is a problem. Another problem is that people write ontologies for a long time didn't realize that there was a problem. So you can have, more if protein A interacts with protein B, then protein B interacts with protein A. That's trivial, isn't it? But it's not true at the type level. Because you can have, it, it can be the case that every protein of type A interacts with some protein of type B. But it may be true that some protein of type B is not interacting with any protein of type B. So, that, and that can influence your statistics about protein interaction if you don't realize that there's not symmetry. There is symmetry at the level of instances. So how do you approach such problems? Um, so the paper, uh, Relations by Medical Ontologies, goes through that in detail in what I call in simple terms. Um, and I think providing you're aware of the problem and providing you do not impose symmetry on your ontology, you'll be fine. You can impose symmetry in some cases, it's just not in all cases. So we probably have to think about lunch, so you're in charge. But there are two people who uh, are quick. You had a couple of things that in here. Yeah. I don't really understand. What that means depends on, has it bearings. 
So your headache inheres in your head. It, it, it means it's of your head. And your headache never inheres in my head. So the, the headaches do not migrate. Yeah? Going back to uh, something you mentioned more earlier on in general question, you mentioned there are two types of ontologies, reference ontologies and project ontology. Yes. That you mainly work. Does the naming of the ontology, like gene ontology, say anything about what type of, because I noticed that some yeah. ontologies are named ontology for something, versus yeah. gene ontology. So we, we don't have a good uh, general strategy in this regard, uh, but um, we, we very much encourage the, both, both for reference ontologies and for application ontologies, names which are clear and correct. So the gene ontology is in fact badly named because the gene ontology is not an ontology of genes. It's an ontology of attributes of gene product. The, but it's divided into three sub-ontologies, molecular function ontology, biological process ontology, and cellular component ontology. Those are properly named. So I, I, I tell the gene ontology that they should uh, die and come back as three ontologies. <laughs> but they don't. They, they like all these acronyms and go in. So similarly, you were mentioning that you know you have the top level, mid level, and the lower level ontology, which I'm assuming are more the application level for the project ontologies. Uh, no, uh, it could be that there are quite low level reference ontologies. So the basically the feature of an application ontology is that it will involve parts of multiple reference ontologies, okay. which are maintained independently by the reference ontology community. And if the application ontology has important needs, they can join the reference ontology community. And I figure that you probably will have such needs. Yeah. So when you're developing a application level ontology or project ontology, does it sometimes trigger the need to go and make changes or make a difference? Yeah, yeah. and that's perfectly acceptable. But what if it is that that is being managed by a different co community? You join that community and make your case. And usually you will find that there is a solution which everyone is happy with. Because we're interested in the ontologies being useful. Uh, so then you keep maintaining that structure. Yeah, absolutely. It's, maybe it's just semantics. Um, so this refers also to functional, functional view of ontologies. So, so our view is that for reference ontologies at least, the, you shouldn't care about what the ontology is for. You should care about the ontology being correct, correct representation of the domain. And the, the functions of the ontology will be different from what you thought. Any people will come up with new functions, as is the case with Go. We came up with uh, multiple unexpected uses. Most of the uses of Go in PubMed are not anything that the gene ontology people had in mind when they built the You do a better job in making your ontology practically useful if you ignore utility and aim for correctness. Do you have any comment on the broad impact of ontologies in other domains, like finance, e-commerce? Hmm. So, the, 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 the successes that we've had in biology and in medicine don't have any counterpart in any other domains that I'm aware of. The, the closest maybe is in aeronautics. The NASA ontology effort is rather sophisticated. There is a lot of work in government and defense and so forth in ontology, some of which is good in part, but they have absolutely no control. There's nothing like the Oboe Foundry. And so you have a million parts, 999,000 of which repeat what is being done next door without any kind of awareness. And uh, this is sad because one of the reasons for the explosion of ontology in the defense domain is that they, they should be a means of connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. so they're just more dots. But I thought that in the globalization of business that's going on, I don't know of any success domain is working on ontology. I know that there's a lot of activity, but I don't know of any success stories. And that may just be because of my lack of knowledge. And not because I'm generally suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> okay.